uh, she was taken on as a Middle East person. And the reason was because she'd worked for UPI, uh, United Press International. And um, she had got, at the time of the Reagan bombing of Libya in 1986, she had got the only interview with Gaddafi. And in fact, she had a long, I don't know if you can call it friendship with Gaddafi, but right up to the end of, her, uh, end of his life, because he was killed in 2011, she knew him. And the other thing, Marie loved clothes. Gaddafi was great on clothes. Oh my God, you know, the silver cape and the leopard skin, you know, the, the lizard skin shoes and the generalissimo's uniform with all that, you know, all those medals and the crazy hats and cloaks. But he, and he, it was very cat and mouse because he, it was well known that he preferred to talk to women than men and he was very predatory. And uh, so she, it was quite a risk going to talk to him. Um, but she did, and she got this extraordinary story just as Reagan was ab about to, to bomb. And then she also had a story of later on, she went back a, a few weeks later, and he was obsessed with green, green was his color. And he laid out these little green shoes and this green gown for her to put on before she went in. And she said, nah, the shoes are too small, I can't do that. But you know, it was always kind of iffy. So he, he wanted to dress her up for the He interview. wanted to dress her up, and then he wanted to take her clothes off. Right. I mean, that, that's, that's, I'm sure that's, that's what that's saying. Yeah, yeah. What an extraordinary relationship. And, and, she, and, and, and the, Arafat, she had a very close friend with, uh, friendship. Friendship, well, I don't know if it's a friendship, but she knew Arafat with, very with well, the, well. Yes, Yasser Arafat, the PLO, Yasser PLO Arafat, leader. Yeah, yeah, the leader of the Palestinians. But um, who never flirted with her at all. I mean, he was always very serious. And she, she got to know his wife, Suha, very well, which was a very good sort of convert. And the reason... Arafat used to give interviews at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he used to have to wait and wait and wait, and it was, it was a nightmare. He never slept, I think. He never the... slept. And the, one of the reasons that Marie used to get interviews was because she had an unending appetite for whiskey and cigarettes. So she would sit up with his aides, drinking whiskey and smoking cigarettes. Arafat himself did not do that, but all of his aides did. And so when Arafat would finally sort of look at his watch and say, oh, it's 2.30, okay, I might see a journalist, she was the only one left standing. <laughs> and so she would get in and, and see him. But they used to have arguments. I mean, she challenged him. She challenged him about terrorism and so on. And there were times when he wouldn't speak to her for six months or so. And then Suha, his wife, would intervene. And one of, her, one of the stories which Marie used to tell, which I used to really like about Suha, is... Um, so this was the time of Imelda Marcos, and I can remember, you know, and the shoes and all the rest of it. And Suha and Marie would be going out to a cocktail party in Tunis together and so on. And then and she would say, you know Yasser. Yasser, he always says I take too long getting dressed. And then, you know, he says I am Imelda Marcos, but I only have eight pairs of shoes. And I thought, there is not a woman in the world of that era and that age whose husband has not called her Imelda Marcos. <laughs> it, it, just, it just is. But the idea of Yasser and Suha and their domestic life, it's not a thing which other journalists wrote about, but Marie did. Well, at the time, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll get back to, to this. I mean, one of the things that Marie did in, in a way, I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't the first uh, woman international correspondent of that stature, but she 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 has inspired, and the the, the profession has changed immensely. Yeah. Partly uh, with her, with her influence, I think uh, you know, the women's role has, yeah. has become you know hugely greater than, than it was. I mean, you know, when we think how sexist the the sure, I mean, but I mean, look, there are role models. There's Martha Gellhorn. There's Claire Hollingworth, sure. Claire Sterling, Virginia Cowles, Lee Miller. Yeah. I mean, the World War II sort of lot of female. Uh, war correspondents, but yeah, and Marie, you know, used to get pissed off, as we all do, about being called a woman correspondent, no, just a reporter, but having said that, um, yeah, I think that there are ways, I mean, I'm going to read a little bit from an early piece, which I think is very important, it's about a woman, um, it's when she went to Borja Albarajne, which was um, a refugee camp in, in Lebanon in the, at the time of the, the war in Lebanon. The war in Lebanon in the 1980s, doesn't matter what it was about, nobody can remember, and even at the time people got confused. Um, but there was a war within the war, the war of the camps, when a militia called Amal, which was sponsored by Hafez al-Assad, the father of Bashar al-Assad, the current leader of Syria, they were besieging this camp. And it became quite well known in the UK because there was a, a, a British nurse, Dr. Pauline Cutting, and uh, 
a, a Scottish, no, she was a surgeon, sorry, a Scottish nurse, Susie Whiten, who were in there sending messages out by by some sort of special kind of telephone, which and, they and had. It's, and it was, it's a refugee camp that's an yeah. urban refugee camp right in the middle of Beirut. That's right. That was um, being shelled and besieged yeah. and shelled. Yes. That's right. So Marie and a photographer called Tom Stoddart, I mean, you couldn't get in, it was besieged. But they bribed an Amal commander to cease fire for one minute. And in that one minute, they would run across the no man's land to get into the camp. Can you imagine the nerve that that took? And the agreement was that exactly 24 hours later, he would cease fire for one minute and they would get out. So they had 24 hours. So they ran across and got it. And of course, they didn't know what they would be met with on the other side because the Palestinian Libera Liberation Organization, the PLO, was in charge of the camp. And they didn't know if they'd get shot by the people as they got in. As it was, they sort of came over the, the berm and the PLO were having tea. And... Um, you know, it often happens like that, and, uh, and took them to see Dr. Cutting and so on. And this was really the first time Marie had seen combat, as it was. And what was happening was that women from the camp were going out to get food, and they would be shot at by the snipers, the Amal snipers. And they would walk along what was called the path of death. And sometimes they would be shot, and sometimes they wouldn't, because Amal were just playing games. Sometimes we kill the women, sometimes we don't. And Marie witnessed a young woman, Haji Ahmed Ali, being shot. And I think that this was a, this was a really key moment in Marie's development as a, as a journalist. So let me just read you a little bit. Here's a little bit from Marie's story. She lay where she had fallen, face down on the dirt path leading out of Burj al Barajne. Haji Ahmed Ali, 22, crumpled as the sniper's bullet hit her in the face and stomach. She had tried to cross to the no man's land between the Palestinian camp and the Amal militiamen besieging her to buy food for her family. And then Marie basically watched her die. And this is what I wrote. The 24 hours she spent in Burj al Barajni had a huge effect on Marie. The image of the young woman lying on the path, her lifeblood seeping into the dirt, never left her. Haji Ahmed Ali had reminded her of Kat. The earring she had noticed was similar to a pair she had given her younger sister. Years later, she would talk about that day in the camp and the horror and fear she saw amongst the Palestinians there. She was proud of her story, believing it had made a difference. As a Sunday newspaper journalist, she had the time to get right into the middle of whatever situation she was reporting on. A variation on the famous war photographer Robert Kappa's maxim, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. Other journalists might remain at the margins, filing from relative safety, but not Marie. She would get up close. She would not write about herself, but her journalism would be distinguished by the intensity of her personal experience. So I think that that's really significant. And also, what's significant is this was a time when you had Gorbachev in power, and this story was on the front page of the Sunday Times. And the Americans looked at it, and the British looked at it, and they put pressure on Gorbachev, and Gorbachev put pressure on Hafez al-Assad, and the siege was lifted within three days. Now, you can never say in journalism, it was my story that made that happen, or very rarely, but Marie and Tom's story was part of a lot of pressure. And so that was why she felt she made that difference. So I think that we're talking motivation, this getting up close, getting, understanding the story. The story wasn't all the, you know, big politics and so on. The story was a war on women, the women being killed. And Marie saw that so clearly. And that, I think, is very significant in her journalism. Right, and, and the feeling that she had very obviously made a difference. Because yeah. that, that's, that's, that, that's, that's where, where we get back to that, actually. And I mean, you, you mentioned when we were chatting before, there, there were, uh, that was um, per perhaps a crucial mm. motivating moment. That was in 1986, is that right? 87. 87, yeah. yeah. And then she was also, I mean, a, a, another uh, turning point was in the, uh, in her, in the Sri Lanka war. And this yeah. was a so Sri Lanka is 2001. And um, no Western journalist had sort of got in with Tamil Tigers for, I think, six years. And she decided that she must do this. And so she, she made her contacts, and um, she crossed the front line, and she wrote, you know, in great 
detail, the description, some of her descriptions in her diary about how, how beautiful it was and the butterflies in the air and, um, you know, and, the, and the, just the, the mist and the trees and the jungle and the, so on. And actually, she didn't get a particularly good story because the tigers did not provide what they said they would do. And she felt, and basically she gave up. And she'd been in like 10 days. And she came out. She, had, she had to sort of hike through the... the yeah, the, it was the hiking. It was a day and a half hike yeah. through the jungle. And it had gone fine on the way in. But on the way out, they kept trying. She had an escort of some old men and some young men armed, who were armed. And um, they tried, and there were government forces around, and they had to go back. And they tried three times, and then eventually... They went and were ambushed. And uh, ambushed by the government forces. By the yeah. government forces. And um, Marie, she just felt this pain everywhere in her chest because it was a you know, it was a grenade that hit her. And she fell down and she had a pain in her eye and her you know, blood was coming and and she had this choice to make. And the choice was, do I lie still? knowing that if they find me, they may shoot me? Do I try and run away, knowing that they'll shoot me in the back if they see me? Or do I get up and put my hands up and shout American journalist when they might shoot me again? And in the end, she, doesn't, she didn't know how long she lay there for. It might have been three minutes, it might have been 30 minutes, but she got up and she said, American journalist, and they shot. And that was when she was hit in the eye. And then she... And then they realized that she was still alive and something was wrong and they, she began to crawl out. And then they, they sort of grabbed her and so on and then she ends up in hospital in, um, in Colombo. Um, but that was when she had shrapnel in her eye and um, she lost the sight in it and when she started to wear the, the eye patch. But that, that choice, that moment of lie down, run away, stand up, that stayed with her, and that was really the beginning of having post-traumatic stress disorder because she had nightmares. I mean, you can imagine, can't you? Every night, she'd close her eyes, or her eye, and that dilemma and that moment would run through her mind again. But she, she I mean, most people on the planet would be frightened off from this line of work after such an experience, but she was back again, and Chechenia came afterwards. Yeah, Chechenia was, was before, before that. Before, but she, sorry. No, I've but, the but, order but of I will talk wrong. about that, because yeah. she had already done things which, you know, might put other people off. But I think that also, you, know, you were talking before about her example, and her story is exemplary, but it's also cautionary. Because Marie really didn't take care of her mind or her body. And it's no secret that she drank too much, and she was reckless. And the result was some extraordinary journalism and an extraordinary life. But, you know, the cost. I'm going to read a little bit from her, her diary in Chechnya. So in Chechnya in 1999, this was, she'd gone, most people, um, the war in Chechnya between the Chechen rebels and the, and the Russian government, and most of us, me, went, we went, on the Russian side, we went and interviewed refugees in Ingushetia, which wasn't very, and we got a little bit across into Chechnya. Not Marie. Marie went in with the rebels when you've got aerial bombardment the whole time. And so there's a, a point where they're bombed, and she spends 12 hours with her escorts and a poor Russian photographer called Dima, who's never quite recovered from it, um, lying in this snow covered field while the MIG circle, and you know, can they see us, can they not see us, you know, all of that. And then they, were, they got close to Grozny, she got some extraordinary stories, um, and then they were going to go back, and the road was cut, the only road. So again, it's the same sort of moment, you know, lie down, stand up, run away. How are they going to get back? They could go down the roads which the refugees were going, and they were strafed there all the time. And so the only way was to walk back through the Caucasus Mountains. We're talking about December. Can you imagine what the snow is like in the Caucasus Mountains? And so they walked and walked, and she kept her diary then is extraordinary. It's in very tiny handwriting, because she obviously worried she was going to run out of pages, and she would be, her body would be found, frozen to death. And the only record of it would be the diary. And then eventually, 
they got to a, a sort of hut just on the, the Georgian, Georgian side. And I'm going to read two bits of diary. And the reason I, I love this because it's the sort of Girl Scout in Marie, because she was a Girl Scout. Um, and then it's the then it's the woman it's the the woman in Marie as well. So it's Christmas Eve, 1999, and she writes in the diary. How bad is situation? We can survive cold and environment in house. Don't think we would have lasted otherwise. Water, plenty. Snow and river three or four kilometers away. Probably not worth the walk, calories used. Food, problem. Down to bread ends. If that sawdust stuff is flour, mix with water and cook. Desperate enough, bucket of onions and garlic, moldy. Morad, that was their Chechen guide, has pistol. Animals? Small things, Morad found bag of nails, were able to fix plastic sheets, look for red berries, mistake to let fire go out, cold seeps in, things they never tell you, constant battle to keep fire going. So there you have Marie working out how to survive. And then in the same entry on the same day, I should be in Paris cooking Christmas dinner. Snowstorm closes in midday, obscuring the mountains in a haze starting on the small, gentle white flakes, then cloud of white. Dima, that's the photographer, thinks of writing a letter to his wife. I'm not worried we won't survive, just how long we have to be here, and the worry I will cause those who care. Does make me think who cares. Mom, if she knows, will have a terrible Christmas. Patrick will be worried and furious. I can't tell what he will feel. I think he does love me. But it's a love where he wants his own life and me to fit into it. Hard to describe even to myself, because he doesn't want me around all the time, more knowing I'm there and the comfort of time together. And so, you know, that's the moment when she's any woman worrying about whether her man loves her or not. And there she is in this hut, this shepherd's hut on Christmas Eve, in the snow, not knowing when she'll ever get out. And those are brutal mountains. I mean, those are really big mountains. They're not some little hill. These are, these oh. are sort of, uh, you know, Alp-sized things. Um, gosh, those are really extraordinary. And uh, to, to um, you, you've mentioned uh, the, the, the sort of final scene, which was her decision to go back into Homs and to this neighborhood of Baba Amr, which was, had been under siege. Um, you know, do you, do you feel satisfied yourself that, that you, you wanted to answer that question, you know, why did she do it? Do you, do you feel that you've, you, you've managed, you've achieved that with your, not, yourself not, and with your book? Not completely, because in the end, you never quite know what, what drives somebody, do you? Um, but yeah, I think it was this issue about thinking that she, she could make a difference. I mean, one of her, her big things was East Timor, where she, she really felt she had made a difference, because when other journalists left East Timor, when the, the UN compound was besieged by um, militia backed by the Indonesian government, and um, who were trying to drive out the UN uh, there after, a, after an election where the East Timorese had voted for independence. And it was extremely dangerous. I mean, the BBC correspondent very nearly died. You know, people, you know, he was hit on the head with a machete, and it was really bad stuff. And Marie, um, and Marie stayed. And she really felt that made a, a difference. I have to tell you one story for me, East Timor, which is relevant. So Marie, one of the things Marie would do is she would not ask her foreign editor for um, permission. She would just do something. And so everybody's editor was ordering them out. And she stayed along with a woman, uh, two journalists, uh, um, Irina and Minka, who were Dutch journalists. And they were the three who stayed. And um, everybody else left. And then she called Sean, her foreign editor, and said, Sean, you know, I'm staying with... Um, Menka and Irina and the others have all left. And he said, so the three of you are staying, you're all women? She said, yes. He said, where, where have the men gone? She said, oh, they've all left. And then she said, this is such so Marie, she said, I guess they don't make men like they used to. <laughs> Which was so unfair because I happen to know of at least one man who went into the mountains with the rebels, which was just as dangerous. But that it's a Marie line. The other Marie line from that story, which I love, is that she eventually gets back to the hotel where she's left, the Hotel Turismo, where she'd left all her stuff when they'd fled to the UN compound, and finds that the rebels have not taken her flak jacket, but they have taken her lacy La Perla underwear. <laughs> they were pretty weird, those militia. Anyway, but staying in the compound, um, it made a difference. It put huge pressure, again, it put huge pressure 
on world leaders and um, within a, a couple of days, the Indonesian government had backed down and the, uh, Australia, an Australian peacekeeping force was, was stood up and, and came in. And I think, and Paul Conroy, who's a photographer who went um, back, went in with, to Homs with Marie, feels that it's hubris that she felt that she could make a difference. And I think that probably was it. And I think it's also this thing about thinking that she had to be, she didn't have it in her not to be with the people. She really, what well, victims of war suffer. She felt she needed to go through that too. She didn't have that distance that most of us have. And it's noble and it's foolish. And it meant that that's, and we come back to the beginning, you know, Jim Moore, Neil McFarker and myself are, are here today, and Marie is not. And it's striking that, that I mean, having been covered some wars myself, uh, I mean, that one would generally avoid siege situations, but she seemed to find herself again and again, virtually every war that you've just described, she inserted herself in a si siege situation when there are more powerful forces surrounding a weak people. I mean, it does seem extraordinary that she would just repeat the same the same yes, risk, but same that danger, was what she felt chance. that that was what other people weren't reporting, and that was what she had to report because most other people wouldn't do it, and she felt very strongly compelled to do that. Yeah, I think should we should we open up for, open yeah. open up for some for some questions? I'm delighted to take questions from the audience. Are there, is there are there microphones somewhere? Uh, yeah, here's a chap with a microphone. Ah, I see. There's one chap here with the, the fellow with the, the glasses and the beard, second row. <laughs> uh, thank you for that discussion. It was completely fascinating. Um, and I wondered, Lindsay, you mentioned earlier on about danger thresholds, and you talked about uh, Marie's. Um, I wondered about your own danger threshold and, and, and how you decide on that, and, and does it change? Um, and is it often different from the, the crew around you and also your editor? Yeah, look, my danger threshold was obviously less than Marie's when it comes to, you know, dangerous war situations, dangerous men, drinking, drugs, parties. I'm so boring compared to Marie. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, these are... Uh, Marie often made decisions by herself. She did sometimes work with a photographer, but she also had a... She had a habit of, if she didn't like the photographer or thought the photographer was a nuisance, she would say... I'll meet you at breakfast at 9, and at 7.30 she would go without, you know, consulting her editor or anything. I can't do that because I work in television. So if I leave without the camera operator, I'm stuffed, right? <laughs> and, so, and so you do end up, it, you know, it's more of a team thing. I usually work with a camera operator, a producer, and a local producer. So there's four of us. And um, I, I had a producer who I worked with for a long time called Sarah, who um, very sadly died but we, we sort of had a system because I would always say I want to go further and I want to go nearer the front line or I want to cross the front line or some madness safe in the knowledge that Sarah wouldn't let me so that enabled me to pretend to be braver than I really am and I say well I would have gone but Sarah wouldn't let yeah, me hold, hold me back hold me back <laughs> yes. yeah. like that but yeah you and I but I think that also the other thing which is different about Marie is that most of us as we get a bit older our we no longer think we're bulletproof because quite a lot of our friends have died. Marie's not the only friend of mine who has been killed in, in wars. And, um, and so, yeah, I've become more cautious. And I've also started to find that some of the things that happen behind the front line are more interesting than things that happen on the front line. And I, you know, that sort of, you know, TV journalists running around, look at me, look at me, how brave I am, so boring. There's usually somebody really interesting to talk to, often a woman who's not right up there in the front line. So all of that factors into it. I, I would say that, uh, I mean, I, I covered the Middle East for 30 years and I sort of developed my own rule of thumb, which is which not, not to get into a situation where journalists are a particular target, where you are the target. If you are, if you are the, the subject of being, you know, if you are actually being singled out as a target for some particular use, that's what to stay out of. And that's exactly the situation that, that, uh, that uh, uh, Marie, Marie got herself into in, 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 in Baba Amr. Yeah, in no, that's definitely yeah. true, but also it's something which has changed over the years because I think that when we started this, Marie, myself, you know, you, you too maybe, journalists were far less often targets than they are today. So today, 
Uh, you know, there was a time, so when Marie is, you know, making friends with Gaddafi and Arafat and all of these people and other, you know, warlords or whatever, they want to get their story out and journalists are the way to do it. Whereas now, you bypass journalists, you do it on social media or whatever. So journalists are just a nuisance. And also, everybody watches satellite television now. In the old days, you know, I could go and you know, talk to some warlord and flatter him and get my story. Now he knows perfectly well that I'm trying to expose the atrocities he's committed because he can just Google me and find out the kind of story I do. And this, this whole phenomenon of kidnapping journalists who didn't, you know, virtually didn't exist, I think. Yeah. You have another question? Yes, there's a gentleman here in the third or fourth row. No, they, you're, you're absolutely right, and Tim, of course, we, we knew. And in fact, Marie arrived in Misrata the day Tim and Chris were killed, and she stayed for, for six weeks after that. And that was a truly, uh, that was, you know, truly terrible. And the other thing which is terrible about uh, Tim and Chris's death is that they might have been saved if there'd been better first aid right down on the, on the front line, which is just awful. There's a question right in the front, front row down here. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, this isn't a question about Marie in particular, but as both of you have covered conflict, um, and you go out into these places and you put your life at risk to tell these stories, but your families are out there worrying for you the entire time. So do you think war photography and war journalism is inherently selfish or selfless? Well, I think there has to be a certain... I mean, anybody who does a dangerous job is in some way selfish, yes. Um, because they, you know, that, uh, their deaths will obviously... Because obviously there's a risk. I mean, the same, you could say the same for soldiers or firefighters. Yeah, any kind of job like that has a selfish side to it because of what might, you know, the suffering you might cause your, your family. Um, so what are you supposed to do? Um, not have a family. That's one way of doing it, but, you know, quite tricky. Um, I, you know, or the other answer is, is do what I've done, which is attach yourself to somebody who does an even more dangerous job. That's good. That works. Um, so I'm not the most selfish one. Um, and, yeah, but you do it for a reason. You, you know, you do it because you want, because you think it's important. You think it matters. And I think that Marie really felt that it mattered. She really felt that it mattered um, to tell the stories of, of these of these people, of people who are the victims of war, and also including conscripts as well. Um, and I, I think that too. I think it really matters. I think that you can't always say, you know, this makes a difference. But I believe, and I think this festival believes, that knowledge is better than ignorance. And the only way you get knowledge is if somebody goes out and finds out what's, what's really happening. I wonder, Lizzie, if you could say something about the, uh, a little more about what a cautionary tale uh, uh, Marie's life is, in, in a sense. I mean, you know, what lesson should people draw? Is, I mean, you know, uh, she, she t of course she took risks, but um, you know, at, at w what point does she, did she stray into hubris? Yeah, I, I think that's really difficult, and I can't sort of find a, a, an actual point where she stayed straight into hubris. But I think that, and clearly she went too far, or she'd be with us today but I think that you and there, there's a there's um and she knew in a sense there's a story of because Marie was a terrible smoker and she was smoking there was a story where she was with a friend of ours called Pune outside the frontline club in in London um and they were smoking and uh, some guy I don't know who was came up and sort of berated them for smoking and she looked at him and she said believe me this isn't what's going to kill me <laughs> right really um and so you know sort of Marie had that that sense I mean I think I'm mean, sort of straying off here. One of the other things I think is really important is about Maria is that she was really funny. She was the, she was the, the best company. And I think that that's, maybe that's another thing about people who lead extreme lives. And so th there was an occasion when um, she and I were in front of an audience like this um, in London. It was organized by Amnesty. And somebody got up some young woman got up and asked the, the classic question, which we often get asked, which is, you know, are you traumatized by what you've seen? How do you cope with the trauma? And Marie looks at me and she looks at the audience and she says, Lindsay and I, we go to bars and we drink. 
No, thanks, Marie. <laughs> well, it, it had the virtue of truth, you know. So Marie always joked about those, um, about those, those things. So there was a certain hubris, but it's, you know, she, I mean, why live a boring life, you know? Why not go and be where history is happening? What else are you going to do, you know? And I, I think she felt that, and I feel that to some extent, too, you know? It just, you know, she wasn't going to lead the slow, cautious path of life, was she? That just wasn't what she was, what she was made for. She wasn't, she wasn't going to stay in Oyster Bay. We have another question in the, in the audience? Yes, back there. Hello, my name is Ritika. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what if uh, when Marie read your story, what would be her remark about your book and what would she think about your perspective of her? She, what, there, was, there were many times in writing this book where there's sort of, I think all biographers find this, when something doesn't make sense. You know, you read this, you've interviewed, you know, I interviewed, what, 100 people or whatever, and they tell me their version of events, and then there's the version of events which is in the diary, and then there's, you know, what you read, and none of it quite kind of adds up, and you, ca you can't work it out. And I was just so desperate to ring her. You know, I kind of say, oh, Marie, why aren't you here? And I can just ring you and say, look, I'm really stuck on what happened in 1999, October. And I could hear her voice saying, oh, my God, come over, let me tell you what really happened. You know, and so I sort of still feel that sometimes, that she would read it, because I say, as a journalist, she was very accurate. And so she would look at it and go, nah, you know, let me, that's not quite right. But then I like to think that she would be, I like to think that she would think that I was honest and I was also, I mean, th this is not a hagiography and it's not a whitewash. There were times in it when I was very angry with her. I was very angry with her for, and there's a particular story about, um, she had a stepdaughter, Anna, um, who I think she, she behaved badly to her. It wasn't she didn't love her, but she, she was careless. She was not made to be a mother, and she was not a good stepmother to this child. And there was a particular incident, which I'm not going to tell you about. You'll have to buy the book to find out. Um, well, I just got very angry with her. I, I, I sort of had to go for a long walk. I said, how could you do that? She was seven. How could you do that? How could you be so neglectful? But I think that Marie, I hope that she would think that I was honest, and also, I think that she would know that the book was written with a lot of love. And what, what, would, what would Marie have said about, there's a film that, that came out a couple of years yeah. ago. What, what would Marie have said about the film? Well, Marie, the film, uh, which is called A Private War, it's not based on the book, it's based on a Vanity Fair article, which was written earlier. And Marie is played by Rosamund Pike, who's very young and beautiful. She would have liked that. <laughs> we all want to be played by young, beautiful actors. Should anyone be ever going to make a film about us? I mean, is it Tom Cruise for you? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it necessarily. I, you know, I, 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 give me a list. You know, yeah, we'll give you a, anyway, a menu. Give so me a menu. She, she would have been very happy about Rosamund Pike. Um, but I, in, it, the film is a bit, um, it's a bit kind of, you know, serious. And uh, she didn't sort of, Marie did not in real life kind of run um, with a cloud of hair across you know, a battlefield saying, I am here to tell the first rough draft of history. She didn't do that. And the film, she isn't very funny in the film. She's rather, she, she's rather serious. And um, so I think in that sense, it didn't get it quite right. But there's another film, which is brilliant. So Paul Conroy, who was her photographer in Homs and also in Misrata in Libya before that, he wrote a book called Under the Wire um, about that last fateful visit to Homs. He was very badly injured in the same attack which killed Marie. And how he survived is a story in itself, and that is the story of that book. And there's a film which is a documentary made about that, which is just brilliant, and I thoroughly recommend it. It's also called Under the Wire. And I think that she would have preferred that because that showed, that showed the real situation, what really happened. Yeah, the real, real grit. Let's see, I think we have, a, we have a hand up way at the back. Thanks so much. You, you started out by talking about uh, Marie on your shoulder. Um, and you also talked about Marie, you know, herself 
going to bed at night uh, thinking about that moment. And I guess, you know, thinking about the moment when she was in the field, et cetera, and this sense of being haunted. And so I wanted, can you tell us, I mean, is she still on your shoulder? Uh, or has she left you alone a bit? Okay, so I, um, those of you who celebrate Christmas, I hope you had a nice Christmas. My Christmas was spent sorting through all Marie's papers because her papers are going to go to Stony Brook University on Long Island. Um, her family is still on Long Island, and her sister Kat had asked me to do that. And she'd asked me to do it way back. And I hadn't done it, and I hadn't done it, and I hadn't done it. And then I saw Kat, Marie's sister, and she said, have you sorted the papers? And I said, no, nah, not yet. Uh, sorry about that. I don't know why I can't do it. And she said, you can't do it because on the one hand, you've moved on, and on the other hand, you can't let go. And that was such a good remark and such a helpful remark. And so this Christmas, I just made myself do it. So I went through all of her notebooks and the documents I have and the photographs and, and so on. And I catalogued everything. Um, I'm very proud of my spreadsheet, by the way. It's really good. I mean, I know you're all going to buy the book, but the spreadsheet, even better. Um, with, you know, all the, what's in the diaries and so on. And I packed it all up, and it's in... There are six boxes of notebooks and diaries and two boxes of documents and one box of photographs. And so Marie now, instead of being all over my study, she's in a corner. And then those, uh, all those documents will go to Stony Brook University for scholars in the, in the future, which I think is great because there's a lot of stuff about Arafat and Gaddafi and about how we, how we did journalism in those days. There's a lot of you know, interesting stuff in there which I think will be useful for, for scholars of journalism. Um, and I think that at that point when the boxes leave, I think maybe, maybe she'll leave me. That's, uh, you know, Mary, she may have been unlucky in, in life, but she was very lucky to have such a wonderful friend uh, to look after, uh, you know, in, in, in her afterlife. Um, I think we still, we still have a bit of time. There's a question over here. Hi, um, my question to you uh, is as a storyteller of a friend, like as a biographer, um, you know, like, and, and another part of it is to s uh, speak about like this archetype of the brave journalist woman that often emerges. Like, what is your relationship with those? It's so hard to tell stories about women. And I often feel like every time you do, um, you, you have to make space for it. Like you have to sort of like make the imagination for it. So um, what did it mean to you personally apart from these things? Why well, did you choose this? Yeah, no, I mean, I think what, one of the things I was concerned about and I'm still concerned about was making a myth of Marie. And to some extent, inevitably, that happened. I mean, there's this book, there's the films we've talked about. You know, the very fact that, you know, there she was in her eye patch and so on. She's, you know, and she was, she was so well known that just the very act of writing a book sort of turns her into a, a myth. Um, and then she becomes a heroine and all this stuff. And I wanted to try and avoid that in, in the book even though I knew it was inevitable. Because she wasn't a myth, she was my friend. And she was this flesh and blood, she was too human. That was Marie's problem, she was much, much too human. She was also, and I, in, a, in a sense, and maybe this is a cliche as well, but when I was thinking about how to write it, I saw there was a very good film um, about Janis Joplin and a, another one about Amy Winehouse. And in a sense, Marie fits into that sort of category of this sort of incredibly talented, damaged, woman, but then you think, oh my God, that's a myth or a cliche as well. So you struggle with all of these stereotypes. Um, and in the end, I hope she just comes out as what she really was. She was really brave and she was foolhardy and she was, um, she was easy to love and hard to help. Thanks so much, Lindsay. I think we've run out of time actually. I'm afraid no more questions. Um, Lindsay will be signing copies uh, outside uh, just after this session. But uh, could we please have a round of applause for, for Lindsay? <laughs> Wonderful book. And I encourage you all to buy. Thank you so much, Max and Lindsay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again to remind you, Lindsay, 
Lindsay will be signing her books. It's as you exit to the left, uh, left, right across the end after Mughal tent. Once again, as you exit to the left of your side, uh, after Mughal tent, at the author's signing lounge. Thank you so much. <laughs>